Welcome to your lecture on prenatal development and the newborn. What you have before you is the definition of development. The definition is the sequence of age-related changes that occur as a person progresses from conception to death. From this definition, we can take away a couple of things. One, these are age-related changes. So this is how we can say things like, most American children will walk by age one. We can say things that there is a normal age for a child to sit up, or we know roughly around what age puberty will happen and when something like menopause would happen. Throughout your life, we know that there are certain age-related changes that happen, and this is from birth to death. The other thing is that these changes are human universals and they happen in a reasonable order. In other words, it makes sense that you should have to sit up before you can actually stand or that you would have to go through puberty before you would have to go to menopause. Developmental psychology will look at a branch of psychology that studies physical, cognitive, and social change throughout a lifespan. The interesting thing here is, is that while all of the pictures that you see below are children and their growth, this has been heavily studied. We're actually very interested today because of the baby boomer generation about how development impacts the elderly. They're living longer and they're going through some pretty significant changes in that period of their life. Issues in developmental psychology are often the nature versus nurture debate, whether things happen continuously or if they're stage based and whether there are things that are stable throughout our life or whether or not we change as we get older. Obviously, the nature-nurture debate has to do with our genetics and our environment. With continuity versus stage, we'll see this when we talk about whether or not development is this kind of continuous progress that just slowly, gradually grows upon itself, or if it's actually just these kind of fundamental stages, kind of like the difference of like walking up a hill versus walking upstairs. And then stability versus change, are things like our personality the same throughout our entire lifetime, or as we get older, do aspects of us change? Basic biology is something that most of you are familiar with. Let's start with the easy one. Men begin producing sperm cells at puberty. Once this begins, they can manufacture sperm 24 hours a day for the rest of their lives. As they get older, into like their 60s, they're going to start to slow sperm production. Women, however, have been thought to have been born with all of the immature ovum or eggs that they will ever have. Only about one in 5,000 will fully mature and be released. There is new research that may prove this wrong, but it isn't conclusive yet. I will put the link to that video in Schoology. We're going to speak about the prenatal period now. This is the developmental period before birth, prenatal. For humans, this is 40 weeks. So not exactly nine months, it's actually a little bit longer than nine months. And we count the 40 weeks starting from the last day of the woman's menstruation. We will look at three phases, germinal, embryonic, and fetal. The germinal stage is the very first stage. In the germinal stage, this is when fertilization has occurred. There's no differentiation of cells, and the cells actually haven't fully implanted into the uterus yet. Literally, you have a sperm cell meeting an egg cell and then cell division. What you see in the picture before you is a fertilized egg undergoing cell division, and those are all what we'd call stem cells. In the germinal stage, we refer to that blastocyst or bunch of cells as a zygote. Like mentioned before, the germinal stage begins with conception. And something really cool happens here. A single ovum with 23 chromosomes is going to be implanted by a single sperm cell with 23 chromosomes to make a total singular human cell of 46 chromosomes. And that one cell will eventually become 100 trillion cells or your entire existence. Within the first 36 hours, there is rapid cell division. Now, during this time, this would not be picked up by a pregnancy test because no changes really other than this rapid cell division is currently happening dramatically in the body that could be picked up by a test that we would have. The cell mass will slowly migrate along the mother's fallopian tubes to enter the uterine cavity. If all things go correctly, the cell mass will actually implant itself in the uterine wall. 
Now understand, sometimes this doesn't go correctly and the cell mass actually will embed itself in the fallopian tubes. We call that an eptopic pregnancy. It's incredibly painful and it's one that will not successfully yield uh, a childbirth um, and potentially could hurt or harm in a very significant way the mother. So if all things go to plan, at seven to 10 days, the cell mass will begin to implant itself in the uterine wall. At this phase, something really important begins to happen. A placenta begins to form. This is an actual organ that the mother creates to help support the life of the baby that would be growing inside of her. The placenta is a structure that allows for oxygen and nutrients to pass from the mother's blood to the fetus because the mother's bloodstream doesn't actually go to the baby. It's used to kind of shuttle food, oxygen, and remove any waste from the baby through capillary interaction. So again, like I said, the exchange takes place across thin membranes that block the passage of blood cells, keeping the fetal and the maternal bloodstream separate. Many pregnancies will be rejected at this point. And what I mean by that is that many pregnancies, because there is some sort of biological incompatibility or something has gone wrong or the body is not prepared for it, the pregnancy won't stay. So about one in five or 20% end with women ever being aware that she was even pregnant. It would just look like a regular period. Moving a little bit further, we get into the embryonic stage. So at two weeks or 14 days, the zygote turns into an embryo. What you see below here is the difference between an embryo and a fetus. They're both 100% human. It's just once further along in development. A 30 day old embryo is six millimeters in length. That's smaller than the nail of your pinky finger. And by 14 weeks, it would be two inches long. And in both of these, you would be able to hear their heartbeat. The embryonic stage is incredibly important. This is one of those times where alcohol and drug use can have such an incredibly horrible and disastrous impact on development. The scary part is, is that most pregnancy tests will not actually detect a pregnancy until two weeks. And for a normal woman, this would be right around when you would anticipate having your period. So you might not know that you're already into the embryonic stage until you are four to maybe even six weeks in, which is much further along and alcohol and drug use could have a huge impact if you're not actually anticipating a pregnancy. The second stage of prenatal development lasts from two weeks, like I said, 14 days to the second month or eight weeks. At the eight week point is usually when you would go see your doctor and get your first ultrasound. But again, things vary from doctor to doctor. Most of the vital organs and bodily systems begin to form in the embryo. So from two to eight weeks, everything that discernibly makes you human is forming. The beginning of arms, legs, hands, feet, fingers, toes, eyes, ears, those are all discernible by the time you get to the eight week stage. Additionally, cell differentiation happens at this time. All of those stem cells become aware of what layer they are in and they turn into your heart and your lungs, your stomach, your nervous system, your hair, your skin. They just seem to kind of on a genetic level know what they're supposed to be. And once they specialize, they become those cells. This is something you do need to know and that is how the stem cells differentiate. So the cells that are in the closest or the most internal layer become your digestive system, your lungs, and your glands. So I think kind of the stuff that's most to the interior of you. You move a little further out and you get your middle layer and those stem cells become muscles, blood vessels, bones, and a couple of other internal organs, but really kind of think of the casing around your organs. And then the very outer layer becomes your nervous system and your skin. At three weeks old and a sixth of an inch long, you can hear a heartbeat. Three weeks old, there is a human heartbeat. This is an ultrasound of my daughter, Mia, when I was eight weeks pregnant. 
and we were anticipating this pregnancy. We were really, really excited. And when I showed this to my father, he said, that's great, honey, what am I looking at? And what you're looking at is that little mass right in the center there. I'll even circle it for you. Right here, that little guy. That would be my daughter. They do something called a crown to rump measurement. And if it is, it is a way that they use to kind of let uh, the doctor know whether or not the development is progressing properly, babies should be within a kind of normal range for development. At eight weeks, they couldn't tell us if we were having a daughter or if we were having a son, but we could see her heartbeat and we could see her move and it was amazing. The embryonic stage is the stage that has probably the greatest vulnerability. And it is because like what we had just previously said, all those physiological structures are being formed. So the presence of a virus, a drug, anything that could corrupt or damage genetic material can have a huge impact. Interference with normal development may have devastating effects, either leading to miscarriage or to permanent deficits in the human. Most miscarriages occur during this period. So even though you may feel like a person isn't that far along, any loss of a child is devastating. And women who have had miscarriages feel it. And there's actually new research out there showing that the mother and the infant will actually share stem cells. The mother will keep some of the stem cells. So even on a biological kind of level, the mothers feel the loss. Most major structural birth defects are due to problems that occur during this embryonic stage. So again, if you know someone who is a drinker, a smoker, who does recreational drugs, they may not know they're pregnant, but it doesn't change the fact that introducing those things can have a huge and devastating effect on a child. We'll look at fetal alcohol syndrome later and what happens to children who are born to mothers that smoke. Neither one of those things is very pretty. The third and final stage that we talk about is the fetal stage. The fetal stage happens from, we say nine weeks to birth. And again, that seems kind of weird because we said embryonic is two weeks to eight but just kind of go with it. We'll say nine to birth, but you can say the end of the eight weeks to birth also. Third stage lasting from two months through birth. The first two months of this stage, rapid bodily growth. So you really don't often show that you're pregnant until right around like maybe, just maybe around the fifth month and no one else would really notice until probably around the seventh month. But there's a lot of space for the baby to grow in in those first couple of weeks. And so there's a lot, a lot of bodily growth. The skeletal structure is going to start to develop and harden a little bit, but baby's bones are still gonna be flexible because they do have to get through the birth canal. They do have the sense of hearing by about 20 to 24 weeks. And what that means is that they can hear their mother's voice, which makes sense because they're inside her body and they will be born with a preference for her mom, their mom's voice. However, they can still hear other things from the outside world, but it's kind of like listening through, I don't know, like a hot tub or a, putting your head under the water in a bath. You can hear, but everything's kind of muffled and muted. So my husband would actually speak to my belly and his sound waves would still impact the baby, but maybe not as clear. During the last three months, brain cells are gonna multiply at a brisk pace. Babies will be born with more brain cells than what they need. They're going to develop a layer of fat under their skin. So they're not needing to regulate their body temperature inside their moms. That is regulated by their mom. So they are in this lovely like 98.6 degree hot tub. It's not until birth is imminent that they need to, car or their body needs to consider developing fat tissue, making sure that they will be able to insulate themselves. Their respiratory and dig uh, digestive systems will mature last. And this is a particular risk for children that are born preemie. We're often concerned about their ability to breathe and then also their ability to, to be fed. So this is my daughter again at 20 weeks. And I know she looks like a little alien because she does, but this shows you how much you can actually see at that 20 week period. So 20 weeks puts you five months in 
and this is usually when they'll determine whether or not it's a boy or a girl. And in some of these photos, you can see the different angles that they were looking for. We wanted to make sure that her spinal column was fully encased, that there was no risk of spina bifida. We got to see that she had all of her fingers, all of her features were coming in, and it was just really cool. When we say something like age of viability, we're talking about the age at which a child could survive outside of their mother. Between 22 and 26 weeks. So that previous picture I showed you, add two weeks. That's not going to be a huge amount of developmental time, but from 22 to 23 weeks, the probability of survival is really low, 14% to 26%. But if you can get them to 26 weeks, a little over six and a half months, their survival probability goes from 80 to 83%. The reality is the longer the baby can stay in their mother and stay in utero, the better it is. It is the safest and best environment for the baby to develop. Like mentioned before, the mother is the host for the baby. She is providing everything from oxygen to nutrients to exposure to things that might be damaging. Mother's eating habits are often highly regulated by doctors. You will get a full list of what you can no longer eat because things that the adult body can handle, you can't necessarily transmit to an infant. Drug use is considered a big no-no and sometimes you have to even consider things that would be considered normal prescriptions that were necessary for your mental health or your physical health. They might not be good for a developing baby. We used to look at, and we do still look at, transmission of other diseases, especially ones that are viral in nature, like HIV. In the 90s, transmission from mother to baby of the HIV virus was very large, 20 to 30 percent. Today, only 2 percent because we're able to give antiretroviral drugs to the mother during their obstetrical care, and that limits the chance of the child picking up the virus. This chart here gives you the critical periods in human development. As you look at it, you see embryo and fetal listed at the top, and you realize that they're going in weeks. It is really important to understand that we start at that third week, right at the beginning of the embryo stage, that's where all of the critical periods start. And if you notice, all of the red, just about all of the red ends in the embryo stage. Critical, things that can be irreversibly damaging, often leading to death, is happening in the embryonic stage. Everything from your central nervous system to your heart, to your upper limbs, your eyes, soft palate, external genitalia. And then as you move into the fetal period, you realize that there can still be minor complications and abnormalities that happen. So really anywhere from that three weeks to that full 40 week, you have to be very careful because you are host to another human life. We call the things that can get through the placenta and be harmful to a embryo or a fetus, a teratogen. Teratogens are any harmful agents, chemicals or viruses that can reach an embryo or a fetus during the prenatal development and cause harm. The most common are nicotine and alcohol and the effects can be anything from slight to absolutely devastating. My son was born during uh, H1N1, which was the, I think it was the avian flu or the pig flu, I don't know, it was a flu. And there was a big concern for women who were pregnant in 2010 that your child could get that flu virus while you were pregnant. So one of the big things that was encouraged and something that I did was I got my flu shot that year because not only did I get the immunity from the flu shot, so did my son. I touched on maternal nutrition. Malnutrition can be as damaging as bad nutrition. When we look at malnutrition, especially when we're talking about uh, pregnancy, things like poverty can be a huge factor. Malnutrition isn't just not getting food, but not getting the right kinds of food. Malnutrition has been linked to vulnerability of developing schizophrenia and other psychiatric disorders later in life. It's also related to low birth weight, increased risk of heart disease, diabetes, and obesity. And again, remember, we're setting up a system to take on a need for calories and food. You don't want to mess with it. 
Women are encouraged to take prenatal vitamins during this period, specifically ones high in what we call folic acid. Folic acid is necessary for good uh, development and prevents things like spina bifida. If you are breastfeeding, they encourage you to continue to take that prenatal vitamin post-pregnancy, so postpartum. So while you're pregnant, postpartum, and if you are intending to get pregnant, even when you're trying to conceive. Maternal drug use, especially recreational drugs, are particularly dangerous for unborn children. Children who are born to heroin addicted parents often are born with an increased risk of birth defects, respiratory difficulties, problems with their own addictions, and are often born premature. Babies with cocaine addicted mothers are often born again with complications and often cognitive deficits because those drugs don't just impact the mother, they get transmitted to a developing fetus. Over-the-counter drugs are often highly regulated by your doctor simply because there may be something in there that's dangerous. So when I was pregnant, I was given a list of all of the things I couldn't eat along with all of the over-the-counter medicines that I shouldn't take. And another little kind of caution from my doctor saying, before I take anything, just to give him a call and just run it past the nurse or past him, which isn't a bad practice. One of the disorders you need to know is fetal alcohol syndrome. Fetal alcohol syndrome occurs when a mother drinks during her pregnancy. It is hard to tell you what that means as far as time frame or quantity. We just know that the amount is equal to excess. Many children who have this will have things like microcephaly, a smaller than normal head. They develop heart defects. They can have irritability, hyperactivity, and delayed mental and motor development. This is the most common known cause of mental retardation in the United States. And the sad part of all of this is that it is 100% preventable. A child cannot develop fetal alcohol syndrome if the mother doesn't drink. Many children will fall short of the criteria for the diagnosis, but because their mother drank while pregnant, they may, they may still show some impairments. So these are often the facial features that you are going to look for in a child who has fetal alcohol syndrome, and they are represented again in the next slide. Each one of these childs is a child that has fetal alcohol syndrome, and if you go back to the previous diagnosis, hyperactivity, inability to pay attention, cognitive deficits. These are four small children who are going to struggle in life because someone chose to drink while pregnant. Anytime you are pregnant, you are responsible 100% for the life that's developing inside you. You might not be able to control for everything, viruses, genetic complications, but there are some things you can control and drug and alcohol use is definitely one, especially when you're not the only one that's going to be impacted by it. In 2015, a study was conducted in the UK that looked at mothers who smoked versus mothers who didn't smoke and the impact on their fetus at 24, 28, 32, and 36 weeks. It's important to note that this was not an experiment and that the mothers were in fact given all of the information about how dangerous smoking could be to their babies. What they were able to find is that the unborn babies of the smoking mothers touched their faces more frequently than the other babies in the control condition. What does that mean? Well, here's a healthy 40 ultrasound of a fetus. They start to have control over their physical movements, which indicates that there is a certain amount of engagement in the motor cortex. This is growth in the central nervous system may result in speech processing delays in infants if the mother is smoking. So smoking can not only just have motor control issues, but speech delay issues. The top picture is that of the fetuses of the smoking mothers. And there's a couple of other things. One, they were unable to control their motor movement, which was problematic. It showed that the central nervous system was not developing control over the motor skills, but they were also grossly underweight. Maternal stress and depression can also contribute to increased fetal movement, but smoking even more so. Their findings said, 
Our findings concur with others that stress that, that stress and depression have a significant impact on fetal movements and need to be controlled for. But additionally, these results point to the fact that nicotine exposure per se has an effect on fetal development over and above the effects of stress and depression. It's also important to note that vaping or smoking, it's not the smoke or the vape per se that's gonna impact the infant, it's the nicotine. So it's the chemical, not the method in which you're getting the chemical that's gonna be so incredibly dangerous for the baby. Again, tobacco use, regardless of how it is given, whether it's through a patch or a vape or a cigarette or a cigar, produces subtle physiological changes that reduce oxygen flow and nutrients to the fetus. So you are suffocating and starving the fetus. Increases the risk of miscarriage, stillbirth, prematurity. Increases the risk after the child is born of something called sudden infant death syndrome, which is when the baby would go to sleep and not wake up can contribute to slower than average cognitive development, attention deficits, hyperactivity, and conduct or behavioral problems. All of those because someone chooses to smoke. One of the big things you guys should know of for this, specifically, specifically for testing, is the idea that the baby would most likely be born underweight. So just make sure you are aware of that as well. When we look at maternal illness, Again, that's not something you can always control, but the fetus's immune system develops relatively late in the prenatal period. So any vaccines or any way that the mother can actually improve her overall health helps the infant. Measles, rubella, syphilis, chickenpox can be hazardous. Uh, in today's day and age, most of us have been vaccinated against those. We already talked about HIV and AIDS. And again, pregnant women are considered a high risk group for vaccines. In other words, if a vaccine comes out, the mother is going to get it because it actually protects two people, not just one, the mother and the infant. Babies are born with a variety of reflexes and you only need to know a couple of them. The most important one is that when the baby is born, it's born with something called the rooting reflex. That means that it will root for its food. So if you stroke its cheek, it will turn towards where its cheek was stroked and it'll start to make a sucking motion with its mouth, looking for a nipple to be fed. Babies are born with a preference for human voices and faces, but specifically their mom. They've been around her, they under, they, they've taken that in over the 40 weeks, but they do like faces and they do like voices and they do a thing called habituation. Over time, they will habituate. They will find mom and dad or whomever is around consistently. They stop, to, they stop spending as much time staring at their faces and they'll start to stare at the faces of new people coming in. It's like getting new information, trying to put together a bigger piece of the puzzle. They like anything that's organized in face shapes. So it does kind of explain why outlets to young infants are interesting. They look like little surprised faces. And like I said before, the smell, the sound, the sight of mom is often something that they are going to have kind of a connection to. This is a couple of the other newborn reflexes. We don't really need to go into them. Mostly you guys need to know that rooting reflex. The reason that we check baby reflexes is to make sure that all of that somatic division of the nervous system, all of those motor and sensory nerves are hooking up to the brain the way that they're supposed to it's essentially making sure that that entire system is on point. Like I said, lots of reflexes. So these are all tested when the baby is first born. You're going to watch a nurse take them through all of these. And again, it is to make sure that everything is hooked up the way it's supposed to in that newborn baby. The last thing we'll talk about is newborn sight. Babies are born with garbage vision. So they can focus on a narrow range of about seven to 10 inches, which is fine because when babies are born, we like to hold them and bring them close to us and get in their faces. Their eyes are incredibly sensitive to brightness because those photoreceptor cells in the back of their eye have never seen light. So they are learning to fire. They are learning to convert light waves into neural messages. They're starting to do those things. The baby also needs to learn how to track objects and control those motor muscles. So there's some control over eye movement, but it's usually kind of short and jerky. Objects beyond, I don't know, uh, maybe about a couple of inches start to be blurred. Their vision is about 2600. So what you see 
at 600 feet away is what everything looks like to them 20 feet away. So you looking at like a sign that's two football fields away is what they see at about 20 feet. So very, very blurry. They can lack convergence, so they don't go cross-eyed very well. They have a hard time focusing at the same point for a long time. And they prefer black and white objects, things with a lot of contour and contrast over things that are highly colored because they don't get color discrimination until roughly about four months of age. It's a developing process. So when people buy lots of really bright toys, that's fine as long as there's high levels of contrast. That takes us to the end of this lecture. Please make sure your worksheet is completed and let me know if you have any questions when we return to class.